A quorum being present, this town meeting is called to order. Please rise for the invocation by Mr. Pacino. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Let us pray as we ask for the blessing on the work we are to do here tonight. We pray for tolerance of all people. It should make no difference where we come from. It should make no difference who we are. It should make no difference where we worship. We should all pray that each of us learns about and accepts each other as ourselves. We see acts of hatred in the world, even evidence of it in our own backyard. America should not be about hate. Martin Luther King said, you cannot fight hate with hate, but with love instead. We should follow the signs that we see in many lawns here in, the, in Reading that say, hate has no home here. Sunday was Veterans Day and the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. To the veterans of all wars, conflicts, and those who served and are serving around the world, we thank you for protecting the freedoms we take for granted each day. We pray for those elected last week to serve in government. We pray their decisions will be in the best interest of all the people everywhere. We pray for the people in California who are affected by fire. We especially pray for the safety of the firefighters battling those fires. Now let us move to the work we are do, do in this hall tonight. We pray that our hearts and minds be opened so that we may receive the wisdom knowledge and understanding of the issues we are that are before us here we pray for respect of all those in this great hall help us to understand those whose thoughts and opinions we disagree with and those who disagree with our own thoughts and opinions as i have stated previously we should be building bridges of understanding and not walls against it we are here to determine what is best for the inhabitants of the town and those who may be affected beyond our town borders. We pray for a clear picture of the issues. We pray that we realize the gift of wisdom, knowledge, understanding that we have asked for previously. We pray that as we then apply those gifts justly to the past, we choose to follow. At the end of this session, we should ask ourselves, did I commit myself to make the needed effort to successfully complete the work that needs to be done? Did I listen? Did I learn? May my, or were my decisions justified? As I have said for many years now, I remind us all that we should consider ourselves as friends here. My friends, there will always be those who will look dubious on what we accomplish here and all the decisions that are made in the town. Every time we enter this great hall, each of us and all of us collectively needs to set aside all distractions and try to determine the past to just, to just and fair decisions that benefit all. We ask that we be allowed to seek beyond our reach and that we'd be able to stand before all those to see the best paths to follow. Emerging from this great hall, we should try to navigate all paths arising from our decisions here and avoid any distractions that, that divide and detour us from those paths. And then with continued follow-up effort, there should be good results from the paths we choose to travel. Praise the Lord. God bless America. Amen. Thank you. And now the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will now read the warrant. Five. To any of the constables of the town of Reading, greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are hereby required to notify and warn the inhabitants of the town of Reading, qualified to vote in the local elections and town affairs to meet at the Reading Memorial High School Performing Arts Center, 62 Oakland Road in said Reading on Thursday, November 15th, 2018 at 7.30 o'clock in the evening, at which time and place the following articles are to be acted upon and determined exclusively by town meeting members in accordance with the provision of the Reading Home Rule Charter. Mr. Friedman moves that we dispense with the further reading of the warrant with the exception of the officer's return. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. This warrant, I, Thomas Freeman, Jr., 11, 2018, notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Reading, qualified to vote on town affairs, 
to meet at the place and the time specified by posting attested copies of this town meeting warrant in the following public places within the town of Reading. Precinct 1, J. Warren, Killam School, 333 Child Street. Precinct 2, Reading Police Station, 15 Union Street. Precinct 3, Reading Municipal Light Department, 230 Ash Street. Precinct 4, Joshua Eaton School, 365 Summer Ave. Precinct 5, Reading Public Library, 64 Middlesex Ave. Precinct 6, Barrow School, 16 Edgemont Ave. Precinct 7, Birch Meadow School, 27 Arthur B. Lord Drive. Precinct 8, Wood End School, 85 Sunset Rock Lane. Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street. The date and posting being not less than 14 days prior to November 15, 2018, the date set for town meeting in this warrant. I also caused a posting of this warrant to be published on the Town of Reading website on October 11, 2018. Constable Thomas Freeman, Jr. Before we begin, I have uh, some comments. At this week's select board meeting, comments were made by a member of this body that were construed by many as a threat. After reviewing the quote, this moderator recognizes the seriousness of the situation. In this day and age, when we hear of tragedies seemingly every week, there was a legitimate concern felt by those in the room at the time, as well as those watching at home. I realize that things are said in the heat of the moment that are, in hindsight, regrettable. However, people need to realize that words do count. That speaker, and of course all of us, need to keep in mind when we're doing the town's business. Steps have been taken for this meeting to assure everyone's safety. We have asked that a greater than normal police presence be on hand, and the department has complied. The speaker in question for Tuesday evening is a longtime member of this body, and his comments understandably put town meeting members on edge. That speaker has asked to make a very short apology statement to this body, and the chair has agreed to allow it. After that, we will need to return to the business at hand. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Um, I stand tonight to apologize for my conduct to the select board meeting Tuesday night. The remark I made was totally out of, of line and made with a sense of total frustration. I am very passionate, as most of you know, about my First Amendment and your First Amendment rights. I felt that while people were listening, they did not hear what I was saying. Just so that you people know, I grew up in with a Jewish uncle, an Italian brother-in-law, and a French-Canadian sister-in-law, so I know all about prejudice. I served in the Air Force, and one night we walked out of a restaurant, among others, in Maryland because they called the fellow airmen niggas, and we walked out. I've taken a great deal of pride in the fact that I've served this country, town, excuse me, for over 50 years in many capacities, and each and every time, I took pride in to stay above this kind of conduct I displayed through tonight. Again, I apologize for my conduct, and I'll try in the future to speak, think before I speak, but I still will speak about what I want. Thank you. This is under Article 1. We have first up is Permanent Builder Committee, Ms. Toomey. Ms. Toomey? Oh, here we are. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Toomey, Precinct 3. I'm also a member of the Permanent Building Committee, and this is a report just to let you know where we stand currently. On October 6, 2015, the Town of Reading, the Permanent Building Committee, was formed and held its first meeting. At this meeting, the PBC was introduced to a town-owned building located at Laurel Hill Cemetery, known as the Cemetery Garage. This facility supports the operation and maintenance of the town's four cemeteries. The building structure and property layout was identified as having substandard conditions, safety concerns, operational inefficiencies, and, in summary, a replacement facility was necessary due to the current building being at the end of its useful life. The immediate concerns were addressed by the facilities department to ensure the building was at least safe for the occupants. Over the following months, the PBC performed site visits to the cemetery garage and all four of the town's cemeteries. We conducted interviews with members of the Cemetery Board of Trustees and the Public Works Cemetery Division Manager. 
gathered previously conducted assessment reports and other data from the town's facilities and engineering departments and held meetings to discuss a path forward for this building. Through this process, the PBC gained an appreciation of the overall needs of the cemetery division, an understanding of their existing resources, and identified operation, options I'm sorry, for construction of a new cemetery garage facility. Additional insight was gained on the other town-owned buildings and how the facilities department manages them. The initial guidance provided to the PBC was that any new facility would need to be sited at one of the existing cemeteries due to limitations on other developable town-owned properties. For operational effectiveness, a maintenance facility at one of the cemeteries was also the most logical solution. The PBC assessed the four options and through an involved process determined the best two locations would be placement of the new facility at either Wood End Cemetery or Charles Lawn Cemetery. Due to concerns at the latter over wetlands considerations and what would be a lengthy and challenging approval process, a focus was placed on further investigation for Wood End Cemetery. The PBC proceeded with gathering additional data on the Wood End property, conceptualized potential site layouts, coordinated with the town manager for beginning a selection process for an owner's project manager to represent the town during design and construction, and concurrently worked to develop the PBC's internal systems and procedures for supporting the town's long-term building needs. As the process evolved in considering Wood End as the site for a future maintenance building, the PBC was presented with many concerns and opposition for such a facility at this location by the local community. The PBC notified the town manager and board of selectment of these developments and subsequent to the meeting held on October 4, 2016, it was determined that town bylaws pertaining to the PBC should be updated and the PBC should expand the siting options to outside the four existing cemeteries. For the remainder of 2016 and the beginning of 2017, the PBC proceeded with updates to the bylaws. The PBC also expanded the investigation to gather information on all town-owned property that would be suitable locations for a maintenance facility or other buildings. The list of viable options was narrowed down based on key factors for consideration, lot size, location, zoning, uh, etc. And site visits to five locations were conducted in August 2017. In September of 2017, it became public knowledge that the town was in discussions with Camp Curtis Guild leadership on officials to develop a shared facility. This would replace the town's present facilities located at New Crossing Road and allow co-locating the cemetery division at the new location as well. The PBC continued assessment of town-owned land, but at the PBC meeting held on November 6, 2017, the committee voted unanimously to discontinue further discussions of the cemetery garage until further information becomes available on the status of the town's efforts to secure an agreement to develop a new DPW facility at Camp Curtis Guild. From the end of 2017 through October 2018, the PBC has focused efforts on working with the facilities department to develop a system for assessing existing town-owned buildings. We are performing walkthroughs and documenting findings. Thus far, Killam and Joshua Wheaton Elementary Schools have been assessed by the PBC. Uh, this is presented by Brad Congdon, the uh, Permanent Building Committee Chair. Thank you. Bylaw Committee Report, Mr. Struble. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Jeff Struble, uh, Precinct 7, Chair of the Bylaw Committee, and born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm here to give you a report on our progress on the instructional motion that was made, I think, last year to uh, remove gendered language from the general bylaw. Uh, I, does anyone need to see it? I could put it up, but uh, if you remember what it was, 
the instruction was to uh, essentially go through the bylaws and take out, oh, thank you, I've got it here. Uh, if you, no. I'll put it up because you don't want to hear me read it. Voila. Um, let me, oh, sorry. I've got my own. I come prepared, Bob. Um, you, um, the instruction was to, um, well, let me give you a, a remark about the timing. I think you recall from last uh, April, uh, our previous chair, uh, Paul Sylvester, had said we were going to be targeting this town meeting to, to bring it all in. Uh, we were progressing on that schedule, but we had sort of a hiccup in the summer, and we had uh, some personnel change and weren't able to meet for uh, two of the months. And when we finally got back together in August, we were just about done with the, uh, with the bylaw changes in the, uh, in the, uh, the bylaw section. But it was decided that there's going to be some give and take uh, between our committee and town council, which, is, which was true, and that the ultimate timing of that uh, happening would put us beyond uh, this date, and that's actually true. Uh, we had our good meeting uh, last week uh, to go over some very substantive changes by town council, which we agreed upon. Um, and we're now it's back with us to have a final draft, which will then go to him for one more say so and then next town meeting we will bring it to you so that's the the reason for the timing um, so what did we do uh, for this we did some research uh, first we looked to see what other other towns are doing this and you can see there's many towns are, are adopting this um, um, things like uh, Arlington Brookline uh, I think Avon it's going down the line. It's not a, a tidal wave, I would say, but it's, it's, it's certainly coming, and most, most towns are, are getting into the, into the line for doing this. And um, I found some interesting research, which I'd like to share with you. Um, which I'll put it up on the board now. This is from the American Bar Association's um, investigation of this themselves in 1989, um, which uh, came to the conclusion that they should uh, try in all, all their members to, um, I'll try and do this if I can. I stole this from my son. That's not it. Should use, should use gender neutral language in all documents uh, establishing policy and procedure. This is, uh, I guess, adopted in February of, of uh, 1989. So um, I have the document here if, some, if anyone wants to have it. I don't want to scroll through it. It's pretty involved. It has multiple footnotes explaining why uh, they went to linguist, uh, linguist, linguistic experts and saying, what does gender neutral language, how does it affect people? And they said it's pretty significant. So. Um, they came to the conclusion that they should try in all documents to go to gender neutral language. And that's probably pretty obvious, but there's one thing I want to show you which might be of interest. Let me see who one of the co chairs was. She was just Hillary Rodham. Uh, Clinton Esquire then, <laughs> but uh, she, was, uh, she was one of the prime movers of this, so um, uh, it's, it's pretty well accepted that gender neutral language should be adopted in all public, pu public documents, and so that's uh, more, more the reason we should be doing the work that we're doing. So um, what we actually did uh, was go through, um, split up, the, split up the, um, the first eight chapters of the bylaw, the, the general bylaws and um, go through them separately, come back to the meeting, tell, uh, identify the language that we wanted to change, you know, come to a, some agreement on what the, that change should be, and then we'd rotate. We'd, we'd give the, uh, the, the pieces to each other, we'd rotate the, the sections to each other and go through them again and uh, try to go through it and find out, uh, try to find all the changes we'd like to make. So that process took about three meetings. Um, and then we thought we had what we uh, what would be a, a, a final document and sent it to town council and oh no, um, 
There, there, were, there was uh, quite a few things. But more, more to the point for what town council showed us is that um, there are ways to do this that are not just changing pronouns from um, he or she to they and theirs. Uh, that is actually quite, quite a wrong thing to do if you have the wrong gender in the subject. So you have to look at it a little more carefully than that. I have some examples here. Well, just one quick example. You're going to get a lot of them in, um, in the next town meeting, but I thought I'd show you something here in, in the rules for town meeting. This is how it looks now. Um, Where are you? I just uh, identified seven, uh, seven pronouns that really should be changed. It's all, sorry, it's a lot to do with the moderator who's assumed to be male. I don't know why. Um, but um, this is the sort of language we had, to, we had to go in and find to try and change. And this is what we came up with. You can see that um, there are many ways to do it. For one, this is the one that sort of came from, in some respects, from town council. Uh, if you look at the second one, first of all, I ran out of juice. Oh, well. uh, the one that says visually, um, we originally had, um, had made that to declare the vote as it uh, appears to the moderator. We, that's how we got rid of him. But it really didn't need to be that verbose, so it just says to it. He changed it to that the moderator shall declare the vote as it visually appears. This is the, um, the sort of concision that I think that uh, town council is sort of striving for us to, to achieve, and we agreed with them. And you'll see many examples when we, we um, bring it to you next town meeting of how that, uh, how that occurred. So it's, it's going through and not just looking at the pronoun, but looking at how, what, what it's trying to say and try to make it clearer with, uh, you know, you're uh, referencing the subject in the, in, in the sentence. Or it's, it's grammar, of course, but um, it's a way to, um, to make it a little more streamlined, using less verbiage and certainly getting the gender, uh, in, uh, the gender out of it. Uh, and then the last two, where you see the moderator twice, uh, that's uh, so where we couldn't think of anything uh, other than to repeat the subject there, which is the moderator. So those are the sort of um, uh, changes you're going to be seeing and what we have been doing on this instructional motion. Uh, so I'd have to beg your patience and wait until next town meeting when we will all dig into this with, with vigor. And to that point, uh, I want to make a, a personal uh, request. We are only four people. We should be five. Uh, we've been at four strength, that strength for a couple of years now, really because no one is applying to the bylaw committee to be on it. I think many people in this room sort of enjoy going over bylaws and, and stripping them apart. Uh, I think it's because of the length, if you have noticed the length of which we deliberate on them, it's, it is, uh, it is a, an interesting subject to many people. If you'd like to uh, dig deeper into that, come on and apply. <laughs> Um, we would love to have uh, like a, a pool of, of, uh, of people who would like to be on the bylaw committee. Um, there's a couple of us who are getting kind of long in the tooth um, and would love to have uh, as many replacements rather than trying to feel guilty if you wanted to quit. So uh, please, uh, if you have the inclination at all, it's, it's not hard work, it's kind of interesting. It's not, it's not, it, you get very interesting discussions uh, about this, which, you know, you're not tying up town meeting doing it. <laughs> uh, you, you get to really, really nitpick. Um, if you're interested in that, pl please fill out an application at the town clerk's office and turn it in, and we'd be glad to interview, to interview you to be on the bylaw committee. Thank you very much. Minister my light department annual update, Ms. O'Brien. Good evening. I'm Dave Hennessy, the chair of the board of RMLD. Talking about the payment to the town of Reading. For almost 70 years, RMLD has been making what's called the pilot payment to the town of Reading. And it's been increasing at inflation rate calculated by the local CPI and now is roughly $2.5 million to the, to the town of Reading. 
For several months, RMLD and the subcommittee have been looking at options for the payment to the town. Through an RMLD study and other data, we have learned much, including a couple things. Uh, RMLD makes the largest such payment of any other town in Massachusetts, pilot payment, any other uh, municipal light plan. We also know that uh, kilowatt hour sales are dropping at about 1% per year at our MLD and a lot of the other MLPs. So it's kind of, and it looks like it's going to be heading that way in the future. So the only way for our MLD to maintain its infrastructure is to not only raise the, fee, the rates consistent with what the costs are, but also increase the rates even further to, to maintain that payment to the town of Reading. Another thing that's uh, driving down the, um, the kilowatt hour sales is innovation. It's a, good, it's a good thing. Innovation, we see people using solar, we see people using better fuel efficient appliances, and uh, are the companies and the commercial customers are having more efficiencies too. That's good, and then we, have, we do have some levers to help build kilowatt hour sales, one being we can do more with electric vehicles and charging. We can also do economic development. So that's a good long-term plan. But we have some short-term things we have to be concerned about. So RMLD is concerned about the, the current payment mechanism. And RMLD and the subcommittee are looking at options right now. And one that it seems to be makes sense is tying the payment more to the kilowatt hour sales. So that's something that's being discussed. Um, and we want to make sure we, whatever we do um, doesn't shock the RMLD, doesn't shock our MLD and we're, makes it so that we can maintain the system and makes it predictable for the town of Reading. And now uh, the general manager, Colleen O'Brien, is going to give the annual report. Ms. O'Brien. Thank you, Dave. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for having me and allowing me to present the RMLD fiscal year 2018 highlights. The annual report that typically accompanies uh, this presentation is a little bit delayed for issuance. We're waiting on pension and post-employment actuarial numbers that are performed collaboratively with the town. And as soon as those audited financials are completed, I will send the report to the clerk for distribution. As most of you know, the RMLD is one of the largest of the 42 mass municipal light plants in the state. The RMLD serves 28,469 meters throughout the towns of Wilmington, Reading, North Reading, and half of Linfield. Wilmington being the bulk of the load at 54.6%, Reading at 20.4%, North Reading at 18.5%, and Linfield at 6.6%. Our mission remains to provide low-priced electricity with excellent reliability and customer service to all four of our towns. Their residents, commercial, industrial, and municipal electric customers. Each year, the RMLD has a theme that aligns with our mission. This year, we focus on electrification. Electrification is best described as the movement to produce electricity with carbon free and renewable resources, and then power everything efficiently with this electricity. The nationwide launch of electrification is upon us and is considered a necessity in achieving carbon emission reductions. We are all familiar with the supply side of electrification as we see rapid deployment of renewable energy sources across the United States power grid. The RMLD has wind, hydro, solar, including community solar, as part of our power supply portfolio. Renewable sources like wind and solar are considered intermittent in producing power. The RMLD has developed a balanced power supply mix that meets all of the electricity demands for all four towns, including filling in these gaps when the solar and wind generation are not available. The RMLD is also working with other municipal light plants in the state to support new renewable projects in New England to establish realistic goals for increasing the percentage of our renewable resources. While each municipal light plant maintains local control, the municipal light plants recognize the importance of doing their part in decarbonizing the global economy. Educating the public on the benefits and costs associated with electrifying the supply side is an important factor. Electrification on the demand side concerns end use technologies in transportation like trains and buses and vehicles. 
residential HVAC, water heating, industrial processes. The projected increase in plug-in electric vehicles and electric-powered air source heat pumps for home are expected to have a significant impact. Evaluating electrification adoption and how this will change electric consumption patterns and peak demands is critical to both the RMLD and the New England grid system. Specifically, what are the electrification technologies available for the highest consuming services like transportation? How does the New England and the RMLD electric grids need to change to meet these demands of electrification? What are the costs, benefits, and impacts of widespread electrification? The answers to these questions are being developed by industry experts in parallel with the deployment of the technologies. We all remember having a bit of technology angst while buying a new laptop. What if they offer more memory? What if they offer more options? Better pixels or a lower price tomorrow? We get stuck in analysis paralysis, but at the end of the day, your student needs a laptop, so we must move forward. The RMLD has impl implemented several initiatives associated with electrification, including electrical vehicle charging and air source heat pump rebates. We also installed four dual port electric vehicle charging stations this year alone, one at which in our parking lot on Ash Street. And we also intend to install one in each of our four community towns. The analysis supporting the implementation of new technology is quite challenging. We have to balance whether we build and they will come, or whether the public demand is already there. Stay ahead of the curve or wait for the wheel to get invented. Every dollar spent must be carefully evaluated within this world of constant change to justify the cost benefit. As EdView's technologies move to electrification, we move forward to make our planet healthier. At the same time, the movement to electrification also supports healthy sales for your utility, which allow the RMLD to continue to meet its mission, which is to provide competitively priced electricity, system reliability, and excellent customer service. The RMLD has sponsored electrical safety and conservation training and art contests in all third grade classes in all four towns. Over the last couple of years, we've added a high school art contest and have reduced cost in producing our annual report by going paperless and using some of this amazing high school student art, artwork. Here are our winners. Go over here. The winner of the Environmental Inspiration Award is Megan Corum of Reading, grade 11. Looks great big, doesn't it? Woo! The winner of the Community Inspiration Award is Laura Buscemi, North Reading, grade 10. The winner of the Clever Award shows Nikola Tesla shaving his peak, Juliana Connor, North Reading, grade 10. Oh, sorry. Oh, you didn't even get to see the joke. Great stuff, isn't it? Look at this one. The winner of the Holistic Award, Yuzi Tian, Reading, Grade 9. And the winner of our cover of the annual report this year for the Global Inspiration Award, Jesse Ding, Wilmington, Grade 9. <laughs> Sales in kilowatt hours, kilo meaning thousands, uh, of hours dropped by 1.5% from fiscal year 2017 to 2018. Projected continued sales decline of 1% per year, most notably due to conservation efforts, forced the RMLD to increase rates to ensure appropriate revenue. The RMLD, however, is focusing heavily on increasing, increasing sales, such as with electric vehicles in, in these air source heat pumps, along with other economic development opportunities. <laughs> Our new outage management system is up and running, and before the end of this winter, we should be able to email, text, or phone you with outage notifications. Please watch for our request to sign up. The RMLD received a state grant for $1 million towards the installation of a five megawatt, mega meaning millions, battery storage unit to be installed in the North Reading substation. The load in Wilmington is growing, and this is great news for all of us. To allow for this growth, the RMLD must build a new substation in Wilmington. 
We are currently working to purchase land off of Route 125 and will be coming to you in April to discuss bonding. While the audited financials are not yet released, I am pleased to report that it was a clean audit with no management letter. Our new RMLD website is sleek, clean, friendly, and designed specifically to house our programs, online store, and automated rebate forms, along with our new outage management system, which will soon include a visual map of the outage areas within, with the updates. Sleek, huh? Everybody remember the old one? Super friendly. The New England electric grid operators forecast energy usage, including peak usage days. Electricity during peak times, typically between the hours of 2 p.m. to 7 p.m., and especially during the summer months, is at a premium cost and results in the operators having to turn on less efficient and more carbon polluting generating plants to meet this demand. When the RMLD sends out our Shred the Peak alert notices, it is a time when you can reduce consumption, help lower costs, and help the planet. There are 2,000 out of 26,000 customers signed up for Shred the Peak alerts and 15 commercial out of 2,400. If you are not already, please sign up at rmld.com under Shred the Peak. That's the skateboarders from last year, remember, or the year before, shredding the high cost and polluting plants off the top. The FY18 Shred the Peak efforts uh, included 2.7 megawatts of solar choice arrays saving approximately $30,000, 2.5 megawatts of gas generation saving approximately $30,000, and a planned calendar year 19 grant supported 5 megawatt battery storage that I spoke of that stored lower pricing and then releases it in pricing. Fifteen large customers shred four megawatts of monthly peaks at 34,000 in savings but missed the annual peak at a potential uh, savings of 318,000. 800 of those 2,000 residential customers signed up shred 0.4 megawatts of monthly and annual peak at a savings of 36,000. How can you help shred the peak, sign up for the alerts, and use some of these suggestions? The RMLD analyzes its rebate programs annually. This past summer, we ran an electric vehicle and smart charger rebate program. Fifty-two plug-in electric vehicles were purchased and delivered under this program in our four towns. Fifty-two. RMLD, hot to go to the press tomorrow, is now offering Black Friday savings on select smart thermostats and LED light bulbs. Check out these rebates at RMLD. I'll be in the paper tomorrow. The RMLD wants to attract new and retain its customers to help keep rates low. The RMLD reaches out to each town's economic development team for opportunities. Here are some of the benefits of receiving electricity from the RMLD. <coughs> Discussing a number of these uh, actually helped bring Osram, Sylvania into the Wilmington town. These are some of what we handed out to them when they were trying to decide which town they were going to move to. The RMLD continues its proactive maintenance programs. The RMLD has an excellent public right-of-way tree trimming program. Trees are the number one causes of outages, but also one of the most beautiful works of art on this planet. We trim with the health and aesthetics of the tree in mind, but we must also focus on safety and electric reliability. With all of the rain, many of the trees are uprooting and taking down wires. Please remember to stay clear of any down wires and call us. We had a three-year LED streetlight conversion program from high-pressure sodium and mercury vapor. Uh, we have completed that with the exception of just a small handful, the 8,000 LED streetlights conversion through all four towns uh, has been completed, making much savings to each of the towns in energy costs. This is a double-pole snapshot. 
The RMLD has completed a significant amount of cir circuit upgrades involving the replacement of hundreds of aged poles. Each time there's a new pole set next to, a double, to an old pole, it's a double pole. A database is queued for each attacher to transfer their wires. As a snapshot, there are currently 65 out of 5,105 double poles in Reading. So, to in conclusion, looking ahead to calendar year 19, the RMLD will be focusing on economic development, electrifications, and its impact. The new substation, maintenance, and continuing to provide all four towns with low cost, excellent reliability, and service. I thank all of you for having me and wish you the best of holidays. RMLD payment uh, instructional motion, Mr. Ensmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, this will uh, be some information to complement what you heard from Chairman Hennessy earlier tonight. Uh, just for new town meeting members, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the RMLD payment to Town of Reading subcommittee. Uh, this was a subcommittee actually created in I think it was 1998 by the Citizens Advisory Board. That's uh, representatives from each of the four service towns uh, selected by the selectmen in each of those towns to represent the interests and advise the RMLD Board of Commissioners on important policy issues. So they created this committee, which had not, not until 2017 been activated to uh, investigate the payment to the town of Reading. So to their credit, they did that. And that group began to meet um, in 2017 uh, and it's, I'll pick it up where we left off at uh, Springtown meeting. At its April 11th, 2018 meeting, the subcommittee on the RMLD payments to the Town of Reading voted 5 to 0 to instruct the RMLD Board of Commissioners to institute a study of the finances of the department as recommended by the RMLD General Manager prior to establishing a more predictable formula for payments to the Town of Reading. Later in April, as I mentioned, I reported this vote to town meeting. It was believed at the time <clears throat> that this study would be conducted by an outside consulting firm and would take six to eight months to complete. Nothing was heard about this study until mid-October when the subcommittee was sent a copy of the promised study. It had been authored by the RMLD general manager in an effort to save money and was dated May 2018. This study was presented by the RMLD general manager at uh, the next subcommittee meeting held on October 23, 2018, after being reviewed by, but not approved by, the RMLD Board of Commissioners. The GM study forecasts declining kilowatt hours delivered, that's kilowatt hours, the raw power measure, to the RMLD service area, but not declining revenues. And there are two attached tables, which I, I could show to you, but are really microscopic here, proving this. Uh, in fact, the chart accompanying the GM's report showed a projected increase from 2019 to 2024 of $3.5 million in base sales of electricity and of $5 million in total RMLD operating revenues despite this projected decline in delivered kilowatt hours. Based on this study, the GM recommended to the RMLD Board of Commissioners and the payments to Town of Reading Subcommittee two possible payment models for the town of Reading, beginning in FY19. Uh, let me bring that up for you. Uh, in the table on the screen, starting at the left, you will see a model discussed earlier by the subcommittee prior to this report coming out, in which revenue to Reading starting in 2020, and by the way, the RMLD is on a calendar year, fiscal year basis, so calendar years, fiscal years are the same. So starting in 2020, uh, that revenue based on a fixed 2.5 annual increase would produce a predictable $325,000 increase 
and revenues to Reading from 2019 through 2024. Uh, that's the first column. Uh, assumes a certain payment to Reading, uh, payment schedule to Reading based on a mills per kilowatt hour model where the mills per kilowatt hour factor declines each year. Note that this model does not track actual revenues, which as I said are projected to increase, but rather kilowatt hours delivered, which are projected to decrease. Under this model, revenues to Reading are projected to drop almost $360,000 from 2019 through 2024. The final, final model on the far right proposed by the general manager assumes payments to Reading based on a declining percent of projected net plant, starting with 2.5% in 2019 and declining to 2.1% in 2024. Under this model, revenues from, to Reading are projected to increase a mere $31,000 from 2019 through 2024, even though the uh, percent of net plan is declining, the value of the net plan is projected to rise slightly faster, so there's a slight increase. So you can see these are very radically different uh, options for future funding. Right now, these are only proposals from the general manager to the RMLD board and the subcommittee, but I thought it important to notify town meeting members about this potentially um, bad news affecting future town budgeting. But I do expect that the Select Board, FinCom, and RMLD Board of Commissioners will meet together beginning in December during the FY20 budget preparation process and continuing on as needed into uh, 2019 to negotiate these plans into better ones that are much more pal palatable to future Town of Reading finances. You all set? School committee, I'm being with uh, Ms. Webb. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members, select board, finance committee, fellow school committee members, town leaders and department heads, school building principals and district staff, administrators, members of the school community, and invited guests. Tonight, in the State of the Schools Address, Dr. Doherty is going to focus on the great work of our students, staff, teachers, and coaches, the tremendous learning and many accomplishments across all aspects of our curriculum and programs. He will also focus on some of our challenges. I want to take a moment to thank Town Meeting and our community for their support last year in a critical operational override to support our schools. We are able to move forward this year, maintaining critical programs, retaining and attracting excellent staff and teachers, and adding key supports and curriculum updates. Our community, all of you, place a high priority on education you are an important partner in the achievement of our mission. With renewed resources, we will continue toward that vision to instill a joy of learning by inspiring, engaging, and supporting our youth to become the innovative leaders of tomorrow that we so desperately need. I am pleased to announce this evening that the school committee has reached final agreements with four of our five collective bargaining units. We have reached a tentative agreement with the Reading Teachers Association, which is currently going through the ratification process. By having these three-year agreements in place, it allows for budget certainty and stability. Got to look at FinCom on those ones. I would like to thank the negotiating teams for, for each of the bargaining units for their support in reaching these final agreements. I would like to acknowledge the tremendous collaboration and persistence of so many of our town and school staff as our community works together to address the acts of vandalism and hate impacting our community. The intimate communication, partnership, respect, and respect between our town manager, our police chief, and superintendent, and so many of their respective staff enables a holistic and rigorous focus on this difficult issue. 
Together, we must all learn to embrace both the subtle and the sometimes vast differences between each of us. When these differences, this diversity, is respected and valued, we become stronger, more creative, and a more vibrant community. We must not be divided by this hate. We must be unified in action, respect, empathy, kindness, and in love for each other. In his remarks this evening, Dr. Darty will recognize students, teachers, and staff for their leadership and contributions. I would like to take just a moment to acknowledge the leadership and recognition that Dr. Darty has received this summer, this year, excuse me. This summer, at the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Executive Institute, Dr. Darty received the Dr. Christos Daulos Award for outstanding leadership and service to the superintendency. He received the Honored Alumni Award from the University of Massachusetts Lowell College of Education, recognizing his leadership in the field of education. He currently serves as the co-chair of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Safe and Supportive School, Schools Commission, and was recently a panel speaker at a Low, UMass Lowell Symposium on Gun Violence. We are deeply grateful to Dr. Darty's leadership and steadfast commitment to the Reading Public Schools and to our community. On behalf of the entire school committee, I would like to turn the State of the Schools address over to Dr. Doherty. Thank you. Dr. Doherty. Thank you, Elaine. Mr. Bonner, I request an additional 15 minutes. Is there any objection? None appearing, Dr. Doherty. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, town meeting members, select board members, finance committee members, school committee, fellow town leaders and department heads, school building principals, district administrators, members of the school community, and invited guests. It is my privilege tonight to represent the hundreds of dedicated educators of the Reading Public Schools and to deliver to you the annual State of the Schools Address. Tonight's address will focus on both the accomplishments and challenges that face our district. However, I want to begin this evening by focusing on our most important resource, our students. And to that end, I am honored to recognize three Reading Memorial High School seniors who are the recipients of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Award for academic and community excellence. It is always difficult to select these students given how many deserving candidates we have here at Reading Memorial High School. The three students being recognized this evening have demonstrated strong academic skills, participate in extracurricular and community service activities, and are currently in the top 5% of their graduating class. I have also had the opportunity to meet with each of them, and they are genuinely great kids, which is a tribute to their families who are here this evening as well. It is with honor and pride that I present this award to our first recipient, who is a student at the Barrows Elementary School and Parker Middle School, is currently the Vice President of the Reading Memorial High School Student Government, and participates in the Mock Trial Club. A member of the National Honor Society and the Spanish National Honor Society, this student has excelled in rigorous classes, including AP Physics I, AP European History, AP Calculus, AP Spanish, AP English Literature, and Honors Accounting. This recipient envisions a career in political science and law and has applied to Columbia University, University of Chicago, Northeastern, Tufts, Boston College, Georgetown, Villanova, and Brown. He has served in three internships, one for the Suffolk County District Attorney, Jones, and one for Richard Hegarty, member of the RMHS varsity hockey team. When asked which teachers had the greatest impact on his educational journey, he said retired Barrows teacher, and I believe town meeting member, Eileen Leterio, Parker teacher, Brian Cormier, and Reading Memorial High School teachers, Julio Bonaghi, Zach Brokenrope, and Jim De Benedictus. It is with great pleasure tonight that I recognize our first recipient, Michael Mealy. Michael, please come forward to receive the 2018 Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Award. Tonight's second recipient 
attended Joshua Eaton Elementary School and Parker Middle School, and is a talented cellist. Academically, this student is a curious and engaged learner who is currently taking several high-level courses, including AP Calculus, AP Studio Art, AP English Literature, AP French, Honors Physics, and Honors World Issues. Also a member of the National Honor Society and the Reading Memorial High School Drama Club, this student is also very involved in community service activities, volunteering at the Reading Food Pantry and the Boston Food Market. She is also a member of the Bold Leader Club, which teaches leadership skills to girls in middle school. Next year, she plans on majoring in archaeology and is applying to Yale, Boston University, Columbia University, Wesleyan, New York University, and Tufts. The teachers who have had a significant impact on this student's journey are Reading Memorial High School teachers Kara Gleason and John Fiore. It is with great honor to introduce to you the next recipient, Madeline Lieberman. Maddie, please come forward and accept the Superintendent's Award for Academic Excellence. This is clearly the fun part of the job. <laughs> Our third and final recipient attended Birch Meadow Elementary School and Coolidge Middle School. A member of the Reading Memorial High School Drama Club, this student is also the Vice President of Finance for the Dance Marathon Club and volunteers at the Reading Public Library where she serves as a net guide and helps senior citizens use the library technology. Academically, this student is taking several rigorous high-level courses, including AP BC Calculus, AP Physics C, AP Art, AP English, and AP French. A member of the National Honor Society, this student is also a National Merit Semifinalist, which means that she is in the top 16,000 students in the country who took the PSAT last year. And she will be notified in February if she is a National Finalist. Next year, she plans on majoring in engineering and architecture and is applying to Yale, Rice, Cornell, and Harvard. The teachers who have had a significant impact on this student's journey are Reading Memorial High School teacher Kelly Beddingfield and Reading Memorial High School English teacher Zach Brokenrope. It is with great honor to introduce to you our third recipient, Megan Corum. Megan, please come down and accept the superintendent's award. These students, together with the dedicated educators who have supported them each and every day, are quite honestly the living personification of the state of our schools. You'll see many more specific accomplishments over the last year highlighted in the two documents that you received this evening. The first document focuses on the accomplishments of our entire pre-K-12 school district, and the other, the Reading Memorial High School profile, is specific to our high school and is distributed to colleges and universities across the country. Before I go further into my remarks, however, I would like to say most of all, thank you. Thank you to all of those who help make our schools and thus our entire community a successful place to learn and grow. This includes our dedicated and caring staff, a strong and committed leadership team, many of whom are here this evening, and the tremendous support that we receive from our parents and from each one of you, truly from everyone in our community. I am proud to work in a school district and in a community where this dedication is part of our culture and where we work together for the greater good and for the future of our children. Without a doubt, the values and spirit of our town, including a commitment to community and to teamwork, are alive and well in our schools. They contribute every day to the success of our school district and provide us the inspiration to continually reach toward our goals, regardless of the challenge. Since I last delivered this address one year ago, there have been significant changes in our school district, and most of it has been positive. For the first time in my nine years delivering the State of the Schools address, I do not have to focus my remarks on the funding challenges facing our school district. This is because our most positive change, which has impacted the entire community, was the community support last April of a Proposition 2 and a half override ballot question which restored and retained teaching positions, adding cur added curriculum materials, replaced outdated and aged technology, increased professional development and training, 
and provided additional curriculum and special education supports for teachers. Because of this additional financial support, foreign language and additional language arts cl classes have continued at our middle schools, class sizes have been reduced at our elementary schools, and our high school is now able to offer more course sections, additional electives, and advanced placement courses for all students. And you heard some of those courses that our high school students are taking this evening. We are grateful for the work that was done by our community, town, and school leaders who worked together to accomplish this significant achievement. I want to recognize the work of Yes for Reading under the leadership of Erin Gaffin and Michelle Sanfi. <laughs> for building the infrastructure and grassroots support necessary for this monumental task. In addition, I want to thank Town Manager Bob LaShore and Town Accountant Sharon Angstrom for their leadership in the and the Select Board and School Committee for their commitment and support toward the override. I also want to thank Chief Financial Officer Gail Dowd for the countless hours that she put into developing two budgets for last year's cycle and her commitment to the detail necessary to explain the budget story to the community. This was truly a team effort and the outcome would not have been possible without everyone working together. Our accomplishments span over a variety of areas. First, I am going to focus on some of our academic achievements. I am proud to announce that our school district has improved in several key areas of our MCAS, SAT, and AP results. We are now in the second year of the next generation MCAS in grades three through eight for literacy and mathematics. And we saw significantly strong scores in both areas for grades three, five, six, and eight. In addition, we saw significant increases in our grade five legacy MCAS science scores. This is part of our teachers and administrators and instructional changes necessary to align with the curriculum state frameworks and the additional curriculum purchases that we have made in science and literacy over the last few years. And town meeting supported a lot of that science purchases in past years. The SAT is also in its second year of the new test and we saw a seven point increase in the critical reading section of the test and a 13 point increase in the mathematics section of the test. And finally, our 2018 advanced placement scores showed that 84% of our students had a passing score of three or higher, an increase of 4% from 2017. This past year was also the first year of the new state accountability system. And although the state discontinued the number rating system, they added descriptors and new indicators, such as attendance and percentage of students in AP and honors courses to give a more complete picture of a school. There is also a greater focus on addressing the needs of the least performing students in each school. I am pleased to report that all eight of our schools received an overall classification of not requiring assistance or intervention, which means that all of our schools are on the right path to student success. In addition, we met the requirements for special education and we did not need technical assistance or intervention. I would especially like to highlight the work of the staff and students of Joshua Eaton under the direction of Principal Lisa Marie Ippolito, where just two short years ago, the school was designated under the old system as a level three school and did require additional assistance and intervention. Because of their hard work, Joshua Eaton had an overall accountability percentage of 81%, the second highest in our school district. In addition to addressing academic needs, we have been continuing our focus on the physical and psychological safety of our students. Each school has been implementing different social and emotional learning curriculum activities and programs that include open circle at the elementary schools, advisory programs, which include facing history and ourselves at the middle schools, and developmental guidance activities at our high school. The overall goal of our social emotional learning programs and curriculum is for each student to have at least one trusted adult that they can go to in our schools and that they feel safe. The physical safety of our students has been one of our top priorities for the last several years. And we have continued to emphasize it this year by working with police and fire to update our school emergency operations plans. Having the facilities department under the direction of Joe Huggins conduct safety audits of each school and build, holding several evacuation and active shooter drills with public safety during the school year. One example of these drills occurred after school ended last June when police, fire, and schools implemented a joint active shooter exercise for two days at Killam Elementary School. 
We are one of the few communities in the region that have done an active shooter drill with all three groups of this level and complexity. We are also fortunate that one of the positions funded in the override last year was a second school resource officer. This additional position has already had a significant positive impact for our schools. In the district-wide Pride National Survey that was administered to parents, teachers, and students last May and June, the category of school safety received the highest combined scores of any other category surveyed. And this dedication is due to the continued focus on this area, the emphasis on school safety drills, the level of behavioral health supports that we have at each level, and the extraordinary teamwork between schools and public safety. I would like to publicly thank P Police Chief Mark Sagala, Deputy Chief Dave Clark, Fire Chief Greg Burns, and our CASA Executive Director Erica McNamara for their continued efforts in working with the schools to ensure a safe and supportive environment. One of the ways that our students build a connection to adults and have ownership to their schools is through the numerous extracurricular and athletic programs that are offered in the Reading Public Schools. This past year, several of our athletic teams and extracurricular activities had successful seasons with four Middlesex League titles and two state championships, one in girls swimming and one in boys lacrosse. Our middle and high school band and chorus programs are very strong and each year several students qualify for state and regional level performances. Our high school jazz band won the highest recognition possible in the state earning a gold medal and performed at the Berkeley Music Center last May as one of the top jazz bands in our state. Our drama club continues to offer outstanding performances including Mamma Mia which is playing this weekend in this very performing arts center. Our outstanding fine arts program along with amazing student artwork is on display each year at our Arts Fest in the spring. Our schools, programs, and school leaders continue to be role models for other school districts in our state and country. In September, the Assistant Secretary of Education for the United States Department of Education and the Associate Commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Education visited Reading Memorial High School, Birch Meadow Elementary School, and Rise Preschool to see and hear about the strong special education programs in those schools. In October, Wood End Principal Joanne King and her staff presented at the National Positive Behavioral Intervention Support Conference in Chicago, the largest conference of its nature in the country. Recently, Parker Principal Rochelle Shanklin spoke at the Anti-Defamation League's 12th Annual Women of Val Valor luncheon in Boston, where she spoke about the strong partnership between the Anti-Defamation League and the Reading Public Schools and the support that they have given us over the last several months. Finally, earlier this year, Reading Memorial High School social studies teacher Kara Gleason and Megan Howey had two articles published on Reading history titled Lives Lived Unfree, Stories of Reading's Enslaved. In these articles, they examined some of the stories of enslaved people who lived, worked, and died and were owned as property in Reading, Massachusetts during the 18th century. I could go on and on about how the Reading Public Schools is a great place for students to learn to thrive and to develop the skills necessary for the next steps after high school. This is due to the dedication of our teachers and staff, the commitment and leadership of our principals, assistant principals, directors, team chairs, and central office and district administrators, and the support we receive from our community and our parents. I am very grateful for their efforts. However, like any school district, there are challenges, and we continue to focus on closing the learning gap between our most vulnerable students, including students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged students, and English language learners. Under the leadership of Assistant Superintendent Chris Kelly and the newly funded K through eight, K through six, sorry, curriculum coordinator positions, curriculum guides are being developed in each curriculum area that align with the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. The aligned curriculum, along with the ongoing training, will give our teachers the tools and support necessary to reach all students in the classroom. In addition, this past year, we, did, we began doing a comprehensive, complete comprehensive review of our language-based special education program and specialized reading services. The result includes developing and impl implementing an action plan focused on improving the program and services for students with dyslexia and other language-based disabilities. We will be doing similar reviews of other special education programs over the next few years. Having strong in-district special education not only benefits our students as they are given the opportunity to be educated with their peers in the Reading Public Schools, but also it is a most, more cost-effective way 
to invest more of our educational funding to the gems. However, without a doubt, the greatest challenge that our school district is facing right now is the number and frequency of hateful graffiti that has been found in our schools. Since October 12th, we have had 10 separate incidents, eight at Reading Memorial High School and two at Parker Middle School, which have primarily impacted our Jewish, LGBTQ, and African American communities. Since May of 2017, we have had 33 separate graffiti incidents in our schools. If in this part of my remarks I come across as angry, frustrated, and disheartened, it is because I am, and so are many others. I am not a member of the affected community, so I will never know how they truly feel. But I do know this, we want it to stop, and we want it to stop now. There is a population of students and staff that do not feel safe in our schools right now, and this is disheartening. The symbols and words that have been found written or etched on our walls, on our desks, in our bathrooms, classrooms, hallways, and stairwells have a deep meaning to those impacted. These acts of hate will not define us as a community, and it cannot defeat us as a community. The acts of hate are not just a Reading issue. The Anti-Defamation League is reporting that anti-Semitic incidents and other incidents have grown to their highest level in two decades in the United States over the last two years. In Massachusetts alone during 2017, there were 93 reported incidents in schools, up from 50 the year before. This year alone, there have been reported incidents of hate speech at, in Malden, Melrose, Arlington, South Boston, Wayland, Newton, Framingham, and just yesterday, Masconomet Regional High School. History has also shown that these issues will escalate in a community before they lessen. As we have seen in so many areas, Reading can be a model for other communities. What I am optimistic about is the way in which our school community, in collaboration with Reading Police and the town manager, have addressed these situations over the past two years. In addition to all of the curriculum and program advances that the schools have made in the last few years, the Reading Public Schools, Town Facilities Department, Town Manager, and Reading Police Department have developed and refined a protocol for notification, investigation, and communication of these incidents. This would not have been possible without all the parties working together and understanding the roles and responsibilities that each have to play in situations like this. This strong relationship, which is not always the norm in other communities, has only grown stronger and is built on communication, trust, and a sense of purpose to keep our students and our staff safe. In addition, we've developed a strong relationship with the Anti-Defamation League, who is providing our students, our teachers and administrators with ongoing training and support. They have been providing student training at our two middle schools and the high school for a world of difference clubs. These clubs will lead the student response in creating a culture that promotes respect and embraces diversity. And last year, the student club here at the high school created a Reading Memorial High School human rights resolution, which was embraced by both staff and students. Along the same lines, we've formed community partnerships with Reading Embraces Diversity, the Reading Clergy Association, and the Human Relations Advisory Committee, who are using their roles to involve our community and help educate them that this is a community problem which requires a community solution. In short, though these challenge, through these challenges, we are bringing people together to forge new bonds and to model the values we hold dear for all of our children. I am also proud of how our administrators, staff, and students have responded to these incidents. One powerful example occurred two weeks ago when Reading Memorial High School, under the leadership of Principal Kate Boynton, led a community candlelight vigil of over 300 people in support of human rights, in celebration of diversity, in opposition of hate, racism, and bigotry. The evening was inspirational and hopeful with stories and reflections from students, staff, and the community. I want to give you a few examples. Reading Memorial High School senior Talia Shore, a member of the Jewish community, told her story which began on May 4th, 2017, when she found the first of many SWAT stickers that have defaced our schools. Talia passionately talked about how her classmates asked why she was getting so upset about a quote, joke, unquote. In reference to the SWAT sticker, she said, quote, how can the deaths of six million of my people be a joke? What is a joke about that? It is not funny, end quote. 
Ring Memorial High School senior Autumn Hendrickson, a member of the LGBTQ community, talked about how we need, quote, allies. We need teachers and students to show their support. She gave several examples of the, of the support that she has seen in the last few weeks and how bridges are being built between different groups of people. Reading Memorial High School English teacher Zach Broken wrote, also a member of the LGBTQ community, told his own personal story about how he grew up in Nebraska, came out as a gay teenager when he was 14 years old, and tried to kill himself in a Nebraska cornfield when he was 15 years old because of the way he was treated and bullied. Fortunately, he was unsuccessful and has become a strong educator and role model for students and an advocate for student voice. This event, along with the community rally on the Common in October, gives me hope and optimism that our entire community can come together to solve this issue. As Martin Luther King once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. We can no longer remain silent on this issue in our community. We are in uncharted waters as a school district and in a, com and a community, in an area that very few districts have had to face. We need to shift from being reactive and defensive to being proactive and working together. I know that I speak for the town manager and the chief of police when I say we are already committed to that vision and direction. For instance, at a time when communities all over the country are seeing an uptick in hate crimes or in hate-related graffiti, the staff and students of Reading have responded strongly and proactively by bringing people together, forming new partnerships, and strengthening our community values of respect and acceptance for all. Our plan focuses on response, communication, teamwork, and education. As a community, we already have a blueprint in place as to how this can be successful in our community. The Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse was formed 11 years ago in response to the growing number of adults that have died to substance abuse. Over several months of discussion with town and school officials and elected officials, the foundation of the coalition was formed. This coalition consists of many sectors of our community, including towns, schools, police, clergy, students, businesses, par parents, and health organizations. Each of us have a role to play in the coalition with definite responsibilities, and it is that interdependency that has led to the success of our CASA. Refinements have happened over the 11 years, for example, a strong partnership with the Middlesex District Attorney's Office created a diversion restorative justice program for students that is now the model for other communities. Town and school staff have discussed how this blueprint might be used to focus on human rights and social justice issues. We have shown as a community that when we work together, Great Bride is an example of that type of effort. To navigate these uncharted waters as a community and create a climate where everyone feels safe and respected. The schools and town government are willing partners to make this happen. I began my remarks this evening by focusing on the students, and I would like to conclude with the same focus. At the candlelight vigil, one of the emotional and inspirational highlights of the evening was the Reading Memorial High School chorus under the direction of Kristen Killian, singing a song from the Broadway show Dear Evan Hansen called You Will Be Found. Unfortunately, I couldn't bring the chorus here tonight because they have their pasta party for the show, because a lot of them are in the show. But however, I am going to share with you the video, the RCT video, thanks to RCTV for videotaping the vigil. I'm going to show you the video clip of them singing at the vigil. <coughs>
another fun part of the job is to listen to them sing. The examples of what you heard and saw this evening are just a sample of why we do this work in our public schools and why your support and the support of this community is appreciated and valued. It is for all students, those who sing, who perform, who compete, who study, who may require additional support and assistance. It's for the students who are anxious, who need our guidance and support, and who have trauma in their lives. <clears throat> On behalf of the 4,282 students and over 600 staff who teach and support these students, thank you for your continued support of our schools as together we continue to make Reading a place where all students are supported, a place where we develop the leaders of tomorrow, and a place where our schools continue to provide the strong foundation for the future of this great community. Thank you. Mr. Friedman moves that we lay Article 1 on the table. Is there a second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. Business under Article 2, Mr. Berman moves that we lay Article 2 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. Business under Article 3, Mr. LaLasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. For those new to town meeting, I'll take a step back. Um, and this is also a time in capital where I think the step back is needed. Article 3 will uh, approve a capital plan. It's a planning document. Article 4 will then fund certain aspects of that plan and other things. So again, Article 3 is just a planning document. Um, in the community right now, I've heard a lot of discussion about three particular capital projects. I want to explain very carefully to the body what you are being asked to do tonight, but what you're not being asked to, to do tonight and what the time frame might be. Um, Dr. Doherty, Athletics, Recreation, Facilities, and Finance staff and myself have met several times since an October 10th financial forum. Um, we've come up with um, a lot of planning documents, a lot of research that's still needed, and I want to get into a, a little bit of it with the three projects. The first one, building security. Uh, for those with warrants, if you're interested, if you flip to page 22, <clears throat> the building security uh, project has two components right now, 500,000 you'll see, see tonight is not being requested. It was already approved last April, but we're changing around what its purpose is slightly for reasons I'll get into shortly. Right now, as a planning document, the capital plan has the re remaining $4 million of the building security project uh, starting next year. So that'll be an FY20 budget discussion this winter. And then um, if it uh, continues along that path, we'll come to this body in April. Um, in your warrant book, there's mention of three or four million dollar grants. We have diff different legislators that have given me different numbers, which is why they're both in there. It's possible we'll get some grant funding. Um, that has uh, provided a discussion with FinCom that perhaps we should slow this down rather than spending our money next summer, much as it's an important topic, uh, we certainly want to explore any options for a grant. So that's, that's the first uh, interesting project that I've heard about. Um, the second one is elementary school space. There is initial funding proposed tonight, and I will get into that also, but the results of that ex exploration and initial funding are totally unknown. Uh, the recommendations are unknown, so there is no current plan to finance that, because we just don't know what the cost will be, what the options are. Um, I, I would expect it to be a significant cost, and significant costs are done with debt exclusions. That's my expectation. So that is not in the, in the current funding plan. The third and final topic that I've heard a lot about can be found on both pages 22 and 25. It's a combination of athletics and recreation. Athletics is found on 22, recreation on 25. Again, there is some initial funding for tonight, and then what was planned or has been planned is FY21 funding. So nothing this summer, nothing for this town meeting, nothing for this summer, but a year from now. Uh, the financial forum discussion uh, had a few unfortunate developments with Turf 2, where it was needed to be put offline during some heavy rainstorms. It really is a tired field. Uh, the finance committee, as you'll see, uh, is requesting some funds right now tonight to study this field and to study um, and to plan out and to design an improvement that could result, and I emphasize the word could result, in a special town meeting this winter. If it were to go to April town meeting, 
Uh, that would not be in sufficient time to get the fields back online next fall. If it goes to a, let's say, early February special town meeting, it still may result in that, but it's possible with, that the athletic department would only lose the summer season. Uh, coupled with that, and the current plan would be to light the four Birch Meadow fields that were previously approved by town meeting. Uh, that may or may not be part of a sped up program for Turf 2. FinCom has asked us to look at the costs to do it sooner or to do it later. So right now, just to emphasize, this document plans both of those activities in fiscal 21. And only this body, through a special town meeting or through next annual town meeting, can change that current plan. So now I want to focus on the uh, existing items for tonight's Article 3. Um, the first wording, there's a slight wording change. Um, through, a procure, through procurement work by the town and school procurement officer, uh, she's visited both the school committee and the select board. She will be vote, visiting the light board. Um, we need to insert the word owner's project management, manager rather, uh, oh, management and design services into this. So that's not a change in request for funding, it's just an additional widening of the purpose. There is no financial change from what you warrant. There is a request for $343,000 worth of capital to be approved tonight. Again, this, this article is the planning document. I'll show you how it's funded and financed in the next article. $200,000 is that request that developed at the October Financial Forum from FinCom um, to design uh, the Turf 2 project. You can see there's some other smaller um, items. I won't really get into any detail. Um, I sort of know what a, bo a boom flail mower is. It's those things that go way up on, sh on crooked hills. I thought they were pulling my leg for a while. In, um, in the elementary school space issue, that's at the bottom of the slide. You can see there is um, a repurposing of some funds and some additional funds. The override of 4.15 million last April town meeting had a 5% capital component, 5% of that number is 207,500. I stood in front of this body in April and asked you to put it into the facilities core budget um, under the permanent build building committee for elementary school space planning. After discussions with the permanent building committee over the last several months, they prefer that a more developed project come to them. So this is a cosmetic change for the 207,000 to just put it under the facilities core department without the permanent building committee attached for the same exact purpose, elementary school space. In addition, there's two sets of $10,000 of expenses that were previously approved that are not necessary. Facilities was able to do that with extra funds last June. Um, so the school department has requested and school committee has voted to approve adding another 20,000 to this project. And lastly, the thing in the middle is again, it's the building securities, um, plan. I mentioned 500,000 and then 4 million. Extensive work done since this was approved previously has concluded that we cannot easily change the dispatch center. Um, it doesn't really belong in any other portion of the, of the police station. And to remove them and house them and continue the 911 services while their space is remodeled is quite a big challenge. Initially, we thought we could move them to another section of the building. It's just not going to work. So we're going to take a step back and we're going to ask that the 500,000 instead be repurposed to a broader use for the entire project to design it. The other additional um, benefit this could have is that I mentioned the three or four. Um, that's in a bond bill and bond generally passed so that politicians can get elected. The funding may or may not ever happen. Um, however, if we have a fully designed project and we believe this is the most important project that any community could ask for is building security. Um, we believe we will have a reasonable chance to see some grant funding out of the state in the next year or so. There's a lot of uh, moving around in FY20, uh, not a big change in capital, and I don't really think any item is, is worth mentioning. Uh, rating agencies require that we give you that much detail for the two years, the current year and the next year. In the enterprise funds, we do have a correction. 
Um, it was just my error. There was a uh, $18,000 item listed as FY19. It should have been listed as FY20. Um, last uh, April, May, it was incorrectly listed. So we're just moving that, and that's a changed here warrant. So the only request tonight is for $145,000 to increase because the project cost for the Emerald uh, Lothrop uh, booster uh, station has increased unhappily. So that's all I have on uh, Article 3. And again, remember, this is a planning document, and I'll get into the funding next. Income report. Mr. McNeese. At our meeting on October 10th, the Finance Committee voted 8-0-0 in support of this article. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. O'Neill. John O'Neill, Precinct 4. It's more a question that shows my, my ignorance, I'm sure. But we have a field, Surf 2 now. It's badly needed repair, so I'm not questioning that. But you already have a field, you know, certain dimensions and everything else. I don't understand what it's, why it would take $200,000 to design a, a field that's already there. If it's for a broader project, including the lighting and everything else, I could understand it. So if you okay, could certainly. educate me. Mr. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, for all the capital planning items that you see, we've done some preliminary work, including getting bids or indications from outside vendors. That's the outside vendor's estimate. And just to be clear, the current planning document for Turf 2 does include some of those things you just mentioned. That would include replacing the existing lighting. The existing lighting needs to be replaced. That would also include expanding the field. As I understand it, certain sports can't be played there because it's not a regulation field. Um, if you know the field, you'll also know there's grass in the edges, and most of that is going to be re replaced by turf. That was not, the t in my estimation, not the best planning to build it the way it was. So if you look at the turf to from the parking lot of the high school to the left, it, the field would be expanded and enlarged a bit. And that's a significant cost element, and that's part of the reason uh, 200000 is required to do this work, to, to do this design work. Further discussion? Yes. Yes. Mark Ventura, Precinct 2. Uh, going back to these fields, I was at a school committee meeting not too long ago. Uh, the subject of the fields came up, um, and there was a comment made, and we are talking about Turf 1 and Turf 2, um, that the fields have been unsafe for years. And I sort of chuckled because my son and about 30 other football players were on turf one at that very time. Um, the lighting project, I believe, was already designed. We had pricing. It was going to move forward. It was pulled out because of the high school litigation or whatever reason. Um, why are we going back into redesign for that? I think both turf fields need to be replaced ASAP. Um, if it's just a matter of elongating the field, I think some of those resources would be better put to the actual replacement as soon as possible. Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, certainly no final decision has been made on what to do with Turf 2. The 200,000 is asked to design it and to study it, and there'll be different options then presented so that this body can decide. I, I um, think the urgency is the immediate replacement, though. Um, we know how long things right. can take well, to again, actually come to fruition. Turf 1 is going to be gone next year. It's probably 10 years overdue. Uh, I wouldn't say it's 10 years overdue. I would say the school committee, by law, if they thought this field was unsafe and dangerous, it would be closed, period. There's no question. Um, the expected life of Turf 1 is anywhere from two to three more years at the most. So I don't mean to surprise town meeting by saying that's right around the corner, but you'll see in your planning documents from the FY20 budget that it is. And there's no funds available for that right now. Um, that's a different problem. 
Um, in terms of the field lighting, yes, this body did approve five fields, including Turf 2, to be lit previously. There's a million dollar debt authorization. We spent $100,000 and the projects are completely designed. Those designs still work. Um, we did not have enough funds with the remaining 900000 when the bids came in. So then Chair Halsey and I sat down and realized the only choice was to cancel it. There were other financial issues. The budget was in tough shape. We didn't feel right to come back to this body and ask for another few hundred thousand. Um, we, again, over this winter, we'll have this discussion. This is currently planned for two years. Whether it comes back faster or not, we'll see. But the current authorization from town meeting is not sufficient to do the other four fields, most likely. That's why. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Binder. Angela Binder, Precinct 5. Um, I have questions about Turf 2 also. Um, I might have missed this. Why is this coming under the Permanent Building Committee and not under REC? Because I was looking under REC and it's not there. And it's under Permanent Building. So why, why is that? 200,000 coming on page 22 and not on page 25. Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, let me just look. There's only a couple of lines on page 22 that are the Permanent Building Committee. Maybe there's only one. Um, the difference between page 22 and 25 is uh, currently the school committee has care, custody, and control over both turf fields. And this, if you will, is the athletics portion of the capital plan. Um, the turf field at, at Parker and the four fields that I mentioned at Birch Meadow with lighting are under the care, custody, and control of the, of the recreation department, the town side, and that's why they're in two different sections of the capital plan. Okay. The permanent building committee has no say whatsoever, and I'm sure no interest in either, any of these projects. Okay, it's, but it does, it does appear Am I right about that? There are some other permanent building committee. Not, it is not meant it's to be not under It's not part them. of the permanent. Uh, okay. Correct. Um, so I, I do have, I have the same question as to why 200,000, why the, if we have some sort of plan to um, repair, replace turf two, why that isn't getting done, why $200,000 needs to be authorized for that. Um, when I'm looking at the handout that was given out at the October FinCom meeting, on the back of it, it has under recreation athletic turf two. So I was thinking that it was part of recreation and not part of school, but it says turf two, 2.5 million, preparation work complete. So preparation work is complete, but design work isn't complete? Correct. Preparation work meant financial estimates for all the components of the project are complete. The first portion of that project would be design work, and the estimate for that was 200000 So that's what FinCom that night in October approved and requested to be put okay, in front of so the body. Okay, so it's not the actual physical preparation of the field or Certainly anything? Certainly not, It's just no. the beginning of that. Okay. No. Um, so the My question is, um, how much of, of this extra capital planning money is coming out of the override? Because I know that 5% um, of the override was to go, 5% uh, five, 5 of the override was to go to additional capital projects. Um, but it was my understanding that that was earmarked for Killam for school for this first year. Correct. So, so what's your question? So my question is, is this coming from that or, no. or not? It's coming no, from... No, again, in Article 4, I'll show you the financing. Um, we don't need to use free cash. This is um, largely driven by savings and health insurance, if you want to look at it that way. <laughs> The override capital um, was presented and it is being requested tonight to still be dedicated to elementary school space. Um, as, as you work forward in future years, you have 207,500 plus 3% a year more or less. So the override did 
generate more capital for the future, which does allow some of these projects to be considered now inside the, inside the levy. So for the, so, so for, so for the first year, that 5% is going to the school, but in future years, that capital money could be used in any way the town chooses. It just, it just becomes part of the capital bucket, if you will. Yes, it could be used in any way under capital. Okay, so I understand that. Um, people I've talked to might have different feelings about that. I'm, I'm, I think when people were thinking about an override, they weren't just thinking about one year, they were thinking about a few years. People who I've talked to um, have been concerned about capital projects and what is considered needs and versus wants. And what I've heard is that there are some projects that might be considered wants and not needs and um, there are priorities in the town, such as the school plant, the, the school building, that should, should be earmarked um, in the future, and that projects that might be considered wants and not needs would change their feeling about debt exclusions in the future. Thank you. Further discussion, Mr. Brown? <clears throat> don't get old uh, Bill Brown precinct 8 uh, one thing I spoke to Bob on the turf 2 field the other day um, there is a complete irrigation system on where they want to expand that could be quite expensive to remove and I believe having watched it every day they did it uh, there's an also a 20 inch water main so it may not be able to be expanded further discussion Oh, Ms. Doctor? Nancy Doctor, Precinct 1. I also have a question about Turf 2. Um, in the October um, financial forum, there was a lot of discussion about repair versus lighting. So this 200000 is lighting included? Because that was a real issue of jumping or glumping together the repair in a lighting project. Mr. Lalasher. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Um, the 200,000 of design does include lighting only for turf two. Um, it, it would be interesting, I guess, to try to replace turf two and redesign turf two and leave the old lights off up to be then replaced at a future date. So at least for de design purposes and presentation of future town meeting, it's all wrapped together for turf two only. So how interesting would it be to separate that out for you? I, I don't see how you can. Uh, the cost of lighting must certainly be smaller than design. We probably have that in a document somewhere. You know, is it 10 or 15,000 out of the 200,000? I can't say tonight. Um, usually this body has asked us for the most thorough investigation up front and then make decisions on what to do, and that's what this is designed to do. Thank you. So another hand, oh, Ms. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Linda Phillips, Precinct 7. Um, uh, a couple of questions about the turf, if I may. Um, my recollection was when we built the high school, it was not part of the reimbursability of the project. It was separate. Is that correct? I would, I would think that's correct based so on today's the, rules. So, so there's, no, the there's no um, connection to possibly getting something from MSBA to replace the we turf? We can't get them easily to pay for kill them. I don't think they'll pay for turf. I, I just wanted to, to get that confirmed. Thank you. Um, on the listing here for under core facilities, the elementary school space planning, which is now at 227500 what's the uh, preliminary intent on that, and how do we know that it's that? going to be over $200,000? Uh, what are we asking in that RFQ, or what are our expectations? Mr. Doherty. Thank you, Ms. Mara. Uh, the, the elementary planning study is to take a look at all of our available space at all of our elementary levels, the programmatic needs. 
that we have. Uh, it also is to do have not done a full-blown enrollment study since one. An enrollment study because are we expecting increase enrollment or decrease in enrollment? Because we're at a 250, we're at minus 250 from the year 2000. Our enrollment has stayed at plus or minus 1% for the last several years. The, the concern that we have is that we've not done one since 2001 and where there are different developments going on in town and we do have a lot of turnover of homes which is leading to an increase in our early elementary school populations. We want to make sure that we have the sufficient space needed for both enrollment and also for the programmatic needs. So that's what this planning study is going to do and to look at Obviously, we also have to take a look at Killam because there are some needs at Killam and what role does Killam play in all this? Like enlarging the Killam building project, for example? We, we don't know, and that's what, the, that's what the planning study would help us with. Okay, because there is a concern that the optional all-day kindergarten program is creating a space crisis, and maybe we should stay within the facilities that we haven't finished paying for yet before we spend 227000 for an enrollment study with numbers that are not exactly accurate. So I'd just like to, to um, make sure that anything that is, that we spend money for a plan for, whether it's a feasibility study, that the information that comes from it is going to be accurate, that we can go to the bank, so to speak, on the results of that, and not what we found that occurred in 2001 for the push for the new elementary school. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the motion under Article 3, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 4, Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, there's quite a number of changes. Um, I won't go over the capital. That's a total of 343,000 you've seen. Um, one of the main funding sources of that is a $205,000 reduction to the health insurance premiums. Um, quite honestly, we could have reduced that by more, but we, but we had no need. Um, you'll see some of the changes as well. The retirement assessment went up 40,000. I think that's growing at 5.7% a year now after some actuarial adjustments. Um, some, a small change in workers' comp premium. If you really need to know the technical details of this, the town accountant will have to explain it, but um, when we settled the high school litigation, a portion of that was uncertainty over how much the MSBA would repay the town. Um, we didn't want to borrow too much and then have them repay us, so we borrowed too little. And this is, um, and they, sure enough, they paid us less than they might have. So this is the final settling up of a short-term borrowing called a bond anticipation note, a ban, that we did uh, about a year ago. Um, the MSBA did not allow some costs that we put in there that we hoped they might. This is the most we could have received. They did not accept it. Enrollment in the Wakefield uh, Vocational School is up. Property casualty premiums are up slightly. Um, hiring for any of you that are in the market to try to hire people is impossible right now. We're at record unemployment levels. Um, Sharon needs a little bit more money for some vacant clerical positions in finance. Um, our police department had an accident. One of the cars was totaled. They were not at fault. Um, insurance will repay 31000 of that, but they need 43000 The insurance proceeds go to the general fund. They need 43000 to replace the vehicle. That's a total of just over $400,000, as you can see. Um, the funding sources are primarily from new growth. That's some of the economic development you've seen. A lot more is coming. Um, this is from projects that were quite a, quite a while ago. Um, the current ones being built have no economic development impact yet. Excise taxes are also higher. Um, with the economic development and the increased population, there are more cars in town. Uh, state aid, unfortunately, took the wrong direction. It was about 120000 lower than we had budgeted last spring. 
we had budgeted a 2.5% increase, and the increase came in less than 2%. Um, and then there's a small adjustment at the end. Um, there's something called state assessments that this body does not, not vote on um, that was a little bit lower than we thought. So you can see the source of funding does not need any free cash. This is why I said we could have taken more out of health insurance. We just didn't need it. The other portion of Article 4 is the enterprise funds. We weren't sure if we were going to be able to go forward with that tonight, but yesterday we did get free cash, which includes enterprise fund balances certified. Um, so as you see in the as you will see in the motions, we are asking for that 140,000, 45,000 from the Emerald for the Emerald Lothrop booster station uh, to be moved out of water reserves. There is no other activity planned in the enterprise funds tonight. Income report, Mr. Burkhart. At our meeting on October 10th, the Finance Committee voted 800 to recommend this article to town meeting. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 5, uh, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This article was added kind of last minute, so FinCom has not um, voted on this particular article. We received a, a prior year bill um, from the, MB, the MBTA um, regarding um, prior year bills that they had billed us in error. They did not charge us the correct amount of CPI index, and they charged us 75.45 for the last three years. But in order to pay it, we do need a town meeting vote. So we you all set? Yep. All right. This is there, is there further discussion? Yes. In the back? No. Oh, okay. Anybody else? This requires a nine-tenths vote. So we will try a hand count first. If it's not unanimous, we will take a, um, a standing count. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Okay, business under Article 6, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you. This article is to approve the disposition of surplus property. We have eight assets in total. They are listed on the slide along with their related departments and estimated values. Approval of this article will allow the town to sell, exchange, or dispose of these assets accordingly. At our meeting on October 10th of this year, FinCom voted 800 to approve this article. Is there further discussion? Uh, did I see a hand? No. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 7, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This article is to rescind the remaining debt on the library renovation project. What you see on the slide is the activity related to the two authorizations that we did have. They totaled $18.4 million. We issued debt twice, and both of those issuances resulted in premiums that were applied to the project. And then we also got state aid. So the remaining amount is 16345 that um, needs to be rescinded because we don't need it. Mincom report, Mr. McNeese. At our meeting on October 10th, the Finance Committee voted 800 in support of the article. Is there further discussion? Yes, on the uh, aisle. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dimitri Sekris, Precinct 4. Uh, while I really would like to get the money back, I would prefer to spend it because at the library, the uh, landscaping, which was originally put in, is was beautiful and it's um, threatened and I wonder if we could irrigate you know water at all so that it could thrive and match the building which is gorgeous just a thought. Mr. Lelasher. 
Um, certainly we can do all that. Um, if the, the body wanted to do that in the future, I would suggest you use free cash, not debt authorization. We can't practically borrow this small an amount of money cost effectively. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote. Again, we will try a hand count. If it's not unanimous, we will take a standing count. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Business under Article 8, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This article is much like the last. It is rescinding the remaining debt authorization on the high school litigation settlement. Um, we did issue debt once and also got a premium, so we applied that to the settlement. And then we got MSBA funds, a little bit less than we were anticipating, leaving 15921 remaining to be rescinded. FinCom report, Mr. Dewar. At our October 10th meeting, the FinCom committee voted 800 to recommend this article to town meeting. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Business under Article 9, Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the MBTA taketh, but the MWA giveth. Um, the MWA has some really good programs um, called Sewer I&I &I to clean your sewer pipes, um, to re reduce leaks, to reduce costs, and certainly to preserve the environment. Um, they have a multi-phase uh, project, or debt authorization rather. It's usually a combination of grant uh, and interest-free loans. That is what phase 12 is. Phase 13 is unfortunately only interest-free loans, but at least that still saves us the interest. And just to be clear, the debt authorization for this is with the MWRA itself. We do not go out and borrow money. They give us the money as a loan and we must repay it to them. So this is a request that town meeting approve the very favorable terms that they will give us uh, for our sewer enterprise fund. Pincom report, Mr. Doxer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our meeting of October 10, 2018, FinCom voted to support this article by a vote of 800. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. I, I, maybe I, it's late, I don't understand those figures, but the totals don't uh, match the, the numbers in the column above the totals. You certainly don't. <laughs> um. By quite a bit. Yeah, some are bigger and some are smaller. Um, the accurate numbers are the ones next to the phases. Phase 11, 12, and 13, I know we're right. Let's, let's look in the warrant book. See if the same mistake was made there. Is it some of the phases are only in, are in later years? Is that it, perhaps? I'm sorry, could you ask that again, Jamie? Are, are some of the phases in later years? Um, sometimes we don't know when they are, so that's a good question. No, I think this is just bad adding on my part for the totals. So if you look in your warrant report on page 10, we've just listed the phases. And then I attempted to add them up here when I went, must have been doing something else. <laughs> but, but we're pretty confident the numbers for the individual phases are correct. The numbers and the motions for the phases are accurate. And you, you can see, um, you know, the breakdown between grant, which is larger, and interest-free loan, which is smaller, until phase 13. Thank you. Any further discussion? Yes. Uh, Steve Herrick, Precinct 8. I'm just curious about the structure of this. Uh, do the grant and loan pieces, the 75-25, I'm assuming the way this is being presented that that comes together. In other words, you can't say, well, I'll just take the grant, forget about the loan or anything like that. Is that That's a, correct. Okay. Um, the second part of my question is the totals. Those numbers, where do those come from? Do the budgets? I think the totals shown here come from outer space. Well. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, actually, yeah, not I mean, the bottom line totals, okay. actually. I was talking about the column totals over on the right. Do those, are the... Oh, yeah, they, have, they don't the, make sense either, so. Okay. It do, looks like do, um, the do, 844 should have been transposed so. as 1040. Um, there is a million and 40,000 um, for each of these three years. The first two years have a large proportion of grant. The last year has no grant. It's right. only uh, so, interest-free loans. Fair enough. I have to uh, do a better so job on the budget this winter. Okay. So, so my question is, does that approximately $3 million, where does that number come from? Is that based upon... Um, is, the, is that a budgetary number that's been developed that, to do what this sewer project will cost, or is there a chance that it will actually be less than that? I'm just curious. Where this, does that number This come money from? is allocated. The MWRA has a complex formula. Or they have a pool of money in each of these uh, uh, phases. Then they allocate it to all the communities that are in MWRA sewer based on usage. So this is the money available to Reading, and any money available to Reading, we always accept it all. Um, this is just allowing the debt. We have not decided how to spend it yet. You will see that in a future uh, capital plan under the sewer enterprise fund, where at the bottom it says MWRA loan. So would it be fair to say that would, did this, would this program not exist, we would at some point probably be on the hook to spend this money on our water and sewer anyways? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? requires a two-thirds vote. We will take a hand count first. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Business under Article 10, Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, this is one of the benefits of sharing an employee between two communities. Otherwise, we may have never known. Both Wakefield and Reading owned small parcel and tax title. Uh, Reading just owned the fr uh, frontage on, um, on Brook Street. Wakefield calls Brook Street Redfield Road, even though it's our road. So that's, that's how they address it, because their houses, which are not using the frontage, are on Redfield Road legally. So when the mailman walks down Brook Street, he delivers mail to Redfield Road, which is pretty interesting. Um, for the amount of money involved, <clears throat> we had certainly discussed making a donation to Wakefield. You can have it. Um, that would have literally required an act of Congress to change the boundary of a town is a Herculean effort that would take at least 10 years. So that wasn't a good option. So we decided to get together and advertise the parcel for sale, both parcels for sale. It looks like one parcel. As a practical matter, it's one parcel. When you mow the lawn, you're mowing one parcel. Um, Wakefield and Reading, as we have learned, have very different legal property disposition methods. We started using the Makefield, Wakefield model. Town Council in Reading stepped in and said, no, 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 as you heard earlier. And so this is now the last step, I know, this is the last step necessary in Reading, and this is a more extensive process in Reading than it was in Wakefield. Um, it has already received a vote from the select board, um, and this again is the final step in the disposition. There'll be a fraction of the $151,000 sale price after expenses, and we won't know until this vote happens, and then if the property changes hands as to what that is, um, whatever that amount is will flow without a vote of town meeting into the sale of real estate fund. There'll be a very nominal annual tax that Reading will be able to collect um, if the assessed value was very low. Um, it's really more to clean up something that was an eyesore to the neighbors. Uh, and also uh, to provide a small home for a family to live in. Pincom report, Mr. Brent. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, at our meeting on October 10th, Fincom voted 8-0-0 to recommend this article to town meeting. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, the motion carries. Mr. Friedman, do we have a motion? To adjourn? No? Is there? Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, this town meeting stands adjourned.